Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Preventing Problem Behavior in Schools, an Emotional Regulation Relationship-Based Approach, the second in our three-part Changing Mind series. I'm Clay Whitehead, the co-CEO and co-founder of Presence Learning. We provide live online speech therapy, occupational therapy, special education instruction, and counseling to thousands and thousands of students across the country every single week. Changing Minds brings you the perspective of some of the world's top experts to help you sort out the complex issues related to neurodevelopmental disorders. We kicked off the series with Dr. Temple Grandin, who spoke to us about the autistic brain, different types of minds, and how educators and families need to focus on the specific problems individual children have and not the larger label of autism. Now, we direct our focus to problem behavior. Educators and parents tell us all the time that problem behavior is one of the biggest issues and sources of stress they face, impacting both academic performance and overall quality of life. Today, we welcome Dr. Barry Prezant, a widely recognized leading expert on classroom behavior management to help educators better understand and address the rising number of behavior problems they see daily. Barry has more than 40 years of experience as a scholar, researcher, and international consultant for individuals with autism and developmental, emotional, and behavioral disabilities. He is an adjunct professor at Brown University and the director of Childhood Communication Service, a private practice. He consults to private and public schools and agencies worldwide. Barry co-authored and co-developed the CERTS model, a comprehensive educational approach for children with ASD. The CERTS model has been implemented in more than a dozen countries, and Barry has published more than 120 articles and chapters, and has presented at over 700 seminars and keynote addresses around the world. His forthcoming book on autism will be published in 2015 by Simon & Schuster, and is based on what he has learned over his 40-year career from persons with autism and their families. Barry will be answering your questions following his presentation today. Please enter your questions for him in the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. We will also send you an email to get the recording and slides for this presentation after the webinar. And now, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Barry Prezant. Thank you, Clay, and thanks to Presence Learning for sponsoring this webinar. The topic of my webinar today is Preventing Problem Behavior in Schools and Emotional Regulation Relationship-Based Approach. And what I hope to share with you is some information that maybe will lead you to look at students with problem behavior from a little bit of a different perspective. So the first question we need to ask is, why focus on problem behavior and why the need for an emotional regulation perspective? This is a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a Buddhist monk. And he said, if you plant lettuce and the lettuce doesn't grow, don't blame the lettuce. Look for the reasons why it isn't doing well. And I believe that this quote pertains beautifully to understanding students who may have problematic or challenging behavior. So often, we look at the students as if what they are doing is totally within their control, or at least to some extent, they are aware of what they're doing and why they're doing it. And so often, that is not the case. So we really need to understand the why of problematic behavior. Let's briefly consider why we need to focus on problem behaviors. As you'll see, it's not just an issue for us as teachers and as administrators, educators, and therapists. Of course, it's a great challenge for the students themselves, especially those students who have developmental and learning disabilities. We do know, based upon decades of research, that individuals with developmental and learning disabilities are at much higher risk for having problematic behaviors. And we will be talking about why that is the case. And in Temple's uh, seminar, she clearly gave examples of individuals with autism, with other developmental and uh, ability, disabilities and learning disabilities. We know that problematic behaviors are a great source of stress for educators, parents, and family members. And in part, that's due to the fact that it may significantly limit access to activities and settings for children and families. Parents often share that 
they feel that they're taking a risk by taking their child out to a park or to a restaurant or to visit relatives if their child has problematic behaviors because they have difficulty staying well-regulated emotionally. We know in school settings, and certainly those of you who are listening are very familiar with the fact that students with problematic behaviors, that those behaviors very often limit learning opportunities for the student, him or herself, and can be disruptive to the classroom environment and to the school environment as well. Just some other points. I think most of you would agree that it's more difficult to develop positive relationships with students who may have problematic behaviors, especially if those behaviors are potentially harmful to you as an educator on the more extreme end of problematic behaviors. And in just a moment, we'll be talking about the continuum of what falls under this category of problem behaviors. We know that individuals in school districts who need to support the development of students with problematic behaviors, that for them, their attitudes and their practices may be influenced by having a student in class or in the school. Um, and we know in general, it certainly impacts quality of life for the child, for the family, as well as those individuals, such as those of you who are administrators and teachers and therapists, whose job is to support students and to help them have a better quality of life through their learning. So what we are going to do now is briefly consider examples of problem behaviors. And first, we're going to talk about nonverbal behaviors, and then we'll talk about verbal behaviors. We know that uh, as I give you some examples, many of you probably will have memories of students or maybe students that you're working with now who demonstrate some of these behaviors. It could be things such as grabbing or throwing objects, in some cases to protest or to refuse an activity, screaming, crying, whining, or vocalizing loudly, and on the more extreme end, behaviors that may be harmful to others, such as biting, hitting, kicking, and scratching. And in some of these cases, it might be directed towards self. Self-injurious behaviors might also include biting, hitting, and scratching. For some students, we may see and observe them bolting out of a classroom I'm charging across classroom or pushing others. And too often, such behaviors are thought of, especially charging and pushing, as aggressive behaviors. And as you'll see, um, we'd like to challenge that notion for many students in the sense that they may engage in such behavior, but it's not with the intention to harm others. It may very well be that they're frightened, they're confused, or they feel overwhelmed in some situations. Some behaviors that are more closely associated with students with autism may include jumping, flapping, rocking, and spinning. And in some cases, such behaviors may be interfering in terms of the child's ability to learn. But in a few moments, we'll be talking about some behaviors that are challenging but might serve a self-calming or a self-regulatory function. In some cases, we see students mouthing items or, or spitting. Certainly a very common behavior that I see in my consulting is dropping to the ground. For example, if you bring a child up to a very noisy cafeteria, up to the threshold, and they see it's a little bit chaotic and noisy, either in a gymnasium or cafeteria, they may go limp and drop to the ground. Again, we may attribute so-called non-compliant behavior in those instances, but sometimes we have to understand that it may be a survival strategy for a student in the sense that they see it as too risky to go into an environment that to them appears to be overwhelming or chaotic. Um, in some cases, when students do not respond to requests or refusing to participate or resisting participation in an activity, there could be many different reasons for that. However, in my consulting experience and all the time I spend in schools, too often the word noncompliance is labeled to such behaviors. Whereas a child might be confused, doesn't understand the instructions, there could be many reasons. Another type of problematic behavior might fall under these terms, zoning out, shutting down, or shutting out. And again, this may occur simply because a child, it's not simple, but it may occur because a child is either not at an arousal level where they stay focused, in other words, they are unable to be alert and maintain attention. And in some cases, shutting down and shutting out is kind of holding at bay um, information or stimulation that is a little bit overwhelming. There are also verbal behaviors that, in some cases, are considered problematic. So 
some patterns of speech, such as immediate echolalia, delayed echolalia, which has to do with repeating speech, as well as perseverative speech, which has to do with repeating things over and over again. If those things that are repeated are questions, they may be considered incessant or repetitive questions. Sometimes such patterns of behavior may drive an educator a little crazy if a child repeats everything you say. But the fact of the matter is that research, and this is some of the research that we've done, also demonstrates that repeating speech echolalia, incessant questioning or repetitive questioning may serve different purposes for students and in some cases may be very adaptive for a child in terms of their learning language and participating. Some students have problems staying on topic and we do know that that is a characteristic of social communication problems in students with autism and students with learning disabilities and other developmental disabilities. Some students blurt out or argue or correct teachers. Again, in many cases, it may seem to be on the surface rude behavior or uncooperative behavior, but we know that many of these students have difficulty learning the rules of social discourse in classrooms. And to a great extent, that puts the burden back on us in teaching the rules of participating, for example, in a classroom conversation. And then another category is what I like to refer to as, as extreme language. When a student says something in a way that appears potentially harmful, very, very extreme. So a few years ago, I consulted to a, a young man, nine years of age, who when he got frustrated in school and he couldn't understand demands, he would say, I'm going to blow up this school. And of course, in this day and age, that is about to land a student outside of school in terms of um, maybe sometimes for a few days or a week because of those threats needing uh, to be taken seriously. Yet in many cases, when a child says things that fall under this category of extreme language, it's because they do not know how to express emotions, especially very, very strong emotions. And that type of expression of emotion is, in a sense, the best that the child can do when they're extremely mad and upset, but very, very challenging to administrators and school personnel because very often we don't know, does this child really mean that in that situation? I once consulted to a child that when he got angry, he said, I'm going to take my hands and insert them through your eye sockets and pull your brains out. Now, obviously, we would not take that utterance literally, but this student um, said those types of things when he was extremely anxious and extremely upset, what we call extremely dysregulated emotionally. Okay, just some brief comments about limitations of traditional behavior management approaches. We've all used and we're all familiar with techniques such as planned ignoring, that we need to ignore the child because we don't want to inadvertently reinforce quote unquote bad behavior with attention. Very often I go into programs where attempts to have the child, if you will, stay well regulated is to earn reinforcers. However, in many cases, if a child is highly anxious, confused, or upset, they would not be able to focus on earning reinforcers as a way to deal with impulsive behavior or behavior that might be considered problematic. Certainly, we're all familiar with the notion of removing a child from a situation, and this can be done in many different ways. Sometimes it is helpful if we do it in a supportive way and we're teaching a child that this is where you can go sit or a place you can go to be better regulated emotionally. But sometimes removal from a situation is presented as punitive. And the problem with that is when a child is engaging in problematic behavior due to a high degree of anxiety or fear or confusion. Some of the general issues around traditional techniques is that they do not focus on building emotional regulatory skills. And we're going to be talking about what those skills are in just a few minutes. And when we write a behavior intervention plan, too often it focuses primarily on eliminating problematic behavior rather than building in all the prevention supports so a child does not need to get to that point, if you will, of reacting in a way that's out of his or her control. Okay, problematic behavior, in our opinion, is best viewed through a bio, psycho, and social perspective. In other words, there are many factors that are often cumulative 
that result in a child engaging in problematic behavior. So in terms of some examples of biological factors, we know very often that individuals who may have sleep disorders, and, and many individuals with neurologically based developmental disabilities, or students who, for example, may come from chaotic home environments, are very often sleep deprived. And this is one of these examples that we could relate to ourselves. Very often we're much edgier and we're more likely to engage in problematic behavior when we're sleep deprived. We know that some students who have nutritional issues, problems with food sensitivities, often have gastrointestinal issues. And once again, we could just think about ourselves, how do we feel when we have a stomach virus or when we feel constipated, for example. One other issue, which is a huge issue with students labeled with ADHD, with autism spectrum disorder, and also learning disabilities, it's what is referred to as a, a modulation of arousal level. And that's a fancy term for, are we able to control our energy, if you will? So in some situations, we may feel very revved up. We can relate to that when we have, for example, if you drink coffee or any caffeinated beverages. And in other situations, rather than being too high arousal and too revved up, we're too low arousal. In other words, we have problems maintaining alertness, problems staying focused, and that's where that zoning out kind of example comes in. So biological factors certainly can contribute to a child's, if you will, risk status for demonstrating problem behaviors. We can all relate to the very, very revved up student for example, who needs to move, who can't stay in his seat, who runs around the classroom. And in many cases, that's neurologically driven due to arousal modulation issues. Psychological factors are many and varied, and this could have anything to do with cognitive disabilities, language disabilities. We do know that problems in communicating lead directly to problem behaviors, because if a child is frustrated in expressing their intentions, for example, saying, no, I don't want to do that, or this is too difficult for me. We may see those protests and refusals through behavior, such as taking, for example, work that needs to be done and throwing it off the desk, or yelling at a teacher when uh, the teacher gives the child something to do that they perceive as much too difficult. Other psychological factors may include what we refer to as negative emotional memory, and we'll be getting to that, back to that shortly. But for now, we are talking about when a student associates a particular person, a particular place, such as a cafeteria or a gym, or a particular activity, such as a math activity, as posing a high degree of stress for them. And then finally, social factors. Many of you have seen the student in a busy cafeteria who becomes overwhelmed by all of the movement and all of the noise. So in that situation, certainly there are sensory issues impacting upon the student. And in the first part of this three-part um, webinar, uh, Temple Grandin spoke in great depth about sensory issues impacting so many students. Social complexity, being in an activity where they have to pay attention to five, six, 10, 15 other students and follow the conversation can lead a, uh, to a great deal of stress and a student's desire to bolt out of an activity like that. So we all know the beneficial impact sometimes of reducing social complexity, or for example, a child having lunch with a, a lunch bunch as a social skills group, rather than putting them in a very, very busy, chaotic cafeteria. So these are the factors that clearly must be considered when we talk about students engaging in problematic behavior. And more often than not, in my experience as a school consultant, we see these factors as being cumulative, including biological, psychological, and social factors. Uh, we also need, of course, to consider the family context. And I would like to talk briefly about that. We do know that many children who have problem behaviors come from multiple risk family situations. And multiple risk family situations involve when parents or family members have a lot of stresses in their life. So for example, living in poverty, being raised by a single parent, even though some children do quite well when they're raised by a single mother or a single father, we do know that in general, that poses greater risk because very often 
we have a parent who's under greater degree of stress due to socioeconomic issues and so forth. So multiple risk families often experience a combination of bio, psycho, and social risk factors. So I'd like to give you an example of that. For example, biological risk factors in a family living in poverty should be quite obvious that very often a family does not have the resources to purchase foods that might provide the best nutrition for a child. A social risk factor for that same family might just be being raised in poverty, which also presents psychological risk factors, such as a child living in a neighborhood where they observe um, violence, or a family where there's a lack of predictable routines due to the stresses on the parents in those situations. A great challenge for educators, of course, is that due to the challenges to the family, to the mother, to the father, that very often multiple risk family situations challenge us in that it's more difficult to engage caregivers under those situations due to the greatest stresses in their lives. So, for example, for a parent who doesn't know um, where the family might be living the next week, or for a family that's living in a shelter, for example, that may not be their highest priority to come to a school meeting to review a child's progress. And just the financial issues of being able to get around, something that many of us take for granted, owning a car, for example, which allows much greater independence. Having said all of that, I remember a few years ago, a mother raising a child in a multiple risk family situation made it very clear when she said in a team meeting in school, please do not judge us, please do not judge me as a parent, please join us and help us. Unfortunately, too often, when parents are under a great deal of stress and they are not able to participate at the level that we would hope, inadvertently sometimes, not intentionally, we give the message that we're judging you in terms of how good a parent you are. And unfortunately, that is a very, very important issue because judgmental attitudes can get in the way of building positive parent-professional relationships. Okay, so we are now going to complete part one, and we will be moving on to defining problematic behavior. Okay, now we need to define what problematic behavior is, discuss the types and causes, and define more specifically what an emotional regulation perspective is. One thing we need to realize is that there is a continuum of what falls along the way we speak of problem behavior. Uh, and in some cases, there actually may be disagreement as to whether behavior is problematic. And I run into this all the time when I consult the school teams where some team members may feel a particular behavior is problematic and other team members may say, well, this isn't such a big deal. Let's pick our battles here. This is really not worth focusing on. So along this continuum, I like to think of varying points. First of all, the conventionality or social acceptability of certain behaviors. So a child might engage in behaviors, for example, such as rocking, while they're seated in a classroom, such as engaging in other kinds of motor behaviors. Uh, sometimes a child might ask questions of another student, which appears a little bit on the rude side, if you will, or might even say something that is off-putting to another student, such as, oh, you got a haircut. I like the hair, your hair much better the way it was last week. Why did you get a haircut? So here we're talking about challenges to the conventionality or social acceptability of behavior, which may go no further than maybe a student being a little bit put off by that or not understanding why the other student would say that. Of greater concern is when problematic behaviors interfere with participation or learning. So this might be the level of activity that a child demonstrates in the classroom, difficulty staying in a seat, needing to get up and pace back and forth, and certainly that may take a child out of their ability to learn and participate in the classroom situation. And in some cases, it may distract another student in the class. And then finally, on the more extreme end of the continuum, behaviors that are truly disruptive, in some cases destructive, and harmful to self, such as self-injurious behaviors, or harmful to others, such as a child literally physically engaging with another student in a way that may be perceived as threatening or harmful. 
But even along that continuum, we may have students, for example, who become extremely fearful and upset and may lose, in some cases, their ability to stay well-regulated on a motor basis. So I've seen students, for example, beginning to flail when they felt they needed to leave a seat or a situation and inadvertently hit a teacher or hit somebody else. And in the most extreme cases, of course, there are some students, and in my experience, this tends to be relatively rare in school when a student is intentionally trying to harm another student. But as I said earlier, so often we see behaviors that may be harmful to others that are not intentional. So a quick example of that. I often hear the term aggressive being used. That's an aggressive student. We have to watch out for aggressive behavior. And when I observe that student, and usually I observe a student in regular routines, in a school day, I do see behaviors that are potentially physically harmful to others, very often staff members or teachers, but a large percentage of the time, and anecdotally, I once actually counted that up over a few days, 70 to 80 percent of the time, that student directed physical behavior towards another person after they were touched or after the other person was trying to restrict their movement. And we have to realize many of these students with sensory issues may be sensitive to touch, what is known as tactically defensive, and they may strike out when somebody unexpectedly puts their hand on their arm or pushes them back into line, even if it's gentle. I once consulted to a young man with Asperger's syndrome who was in seclusion, meaning that he needed to be out of his classroom and in a resource room for the day, and I asked him why he was having to sit there, and he said, because he uh, hit the teacher. And I said, why did you hit the teacher? And he said, because she was strangling me. And my, uh, the description that was given to me of that situation was that this young student, and he was a young um, elementary age student, was running around the gym, was so revved up, couldn't calm down, and after verbal requests for him to join his uh, classmates back in line, he still did not calm down, and the teacher had to run out in the gym and put her hands on his shoulders at the time that he was extremely revved up, and he just went ahead and started hitting her. So maybe from his perception, he thought he was being strangled in that situation. We do know that students with sensory issues, especially being very sensitive to touch, very often misperceive the intention of the other person, even if touch might be done in a supportive way. So how do we decide what's problematic? Well, too often it's a subjective and haphazard process and too often decided by just one individual rather than a true team process. It needs to be a collaborative, informed, and systematic team process. And ideally, having parents fully engaged in the process. Too often I see disagreements, for example, that a school team decides, well, this particular pattern of behavior is problematic, such as speaking in a loud voice in a library, and of course we want to teach the student what it is to speak in a lower voice and to experience literally physically what it feels like to speak in a voice of lower volume, whereas at home the parents don't see that as a problem because so often the child does that out on the playground or in situations where it's more appropriate to use a loud voice. Okay, so as we mentioned, when we talk about a continuum of problem behavior, sometimes there's problematic behavior that is definitely a problem. There's a consensus on the part of parents and most of the school team, and that would be behavior that interferes significantly with learning, that's potentially harmful to others or harmful to self. Then there are gray area issues around problem behavior. And this might be behaviors that are problematic in some situations, but not in other situations. So for example, bolting around the playground when you're playing a game of tag is totally acceptable, but doing that in a classroom is not acceptable. The example I just gave, speaking in a loud voice on the playground may not be such a big issue, but speaking in a library in a loud voice. And then there are behaviors that are questionable. So for example, I've gone into school situations where a child stared at his fingers a lot, what some people call self-spin behaviors, or maybe rocked in his seat, and where some team members actually say, well, he does that as a way to help himself regulate and it's not such a big deal. It doesn't distract others. It doesn't interfere with his learning. As a matter of fact, in some cases, they help learning. Where other people might say, well, that behavior makes him look different. So we need to identify that as a problematic behavior. The point is, it's so important for school teams to have these discussions 
ideally with parents, so we could make good, informed decisions based upon consensus. I often hear comments um, in my school consulting, but if you really look at them carefully, they're blaming the child rather than asking the why, the why question, and then moving ahead as a team to problem solve. So comments such as, well, it's a control issue. He just likes to control everything. And by the way, all human beings control usually to try to stay well-regulated emotionally. And if you look at your own lives, we often do the same thing. It's non-compliant behavior. Well, why isn't he complying with requests? Is it that he doesn't understand? Is it that he's overwhelmed? Is it that he's fearful? She's being manipulative. Too often, we attribute much greater social savvy to our students who have developmental issues and learning problems. And when you really think of it, you know, does that student really stay up all night long to figure out how to make you as a teacher or an administrator crazy the next day? Or she doesn't need those supports. I think either lack of support or premature withdrawal of support. Um, and it could be learning support, such as visuals. In my experience, that's a great reason, one of the most common reasons, that we see problematic behavior. He understands everything. He's just trying to get out of this activity, math, whatever it might be. And, and so often, um, our students do not fully understand what we're asking. He's just stimming. And um, you know that's probably more of an issue for students with a label on the autism spectrum. Yet, adults with autism now are telling us, well, I do this because it helps me when I'm feeling nervous. OK, I might rock, I might pace whatever it might be, or I look at my fingers when things are overwhelming. We're actually learning from people with disabilities a lot more now, which helps us in good educational decision making. Or he's so aggressive, and I mentioned that earlier. Too often, any kind of what is perceived as harmful physical contact falls under the label of aggression, but we define aggression as the intent to harm somebody. OK, so that is the end of our consideration of problem behaviors, causes, and types of problem behaviors. And now we'll begin to talk about educational and programming issues. OK, so now that we've discussed how do we define problematic behavior, what are some of the risk factors, and why is there a need to have a different perspective, especially a different team-based perspective in schools, now we're going to get a little bit more specific about educational programming and intervention issues from this perspective. So again, just a, a quick review when we talk about causes. Um, yes, there very often are within child factors, which from an intervention perspective tells us right away if there are factors within our control. For example, students who have sleep disorders or have problems with sleeping in general may be due to the lack of a bedtime routine in the home environment. We could certainly support the families around those issues. As a matter of fact, in my consulting, when I see kids with chronic sleep disorders, very often I will ask the parent, have you considered going to a sleep clinic? Not too many years ago, we didn't have sleep clinics around the country. And I have spoken to the directors of some sleep clinics very often in hospital situations. And they say they're seeing more students with learning disabilities, with autism spectrum disorders, with ADHD now than they've ever seen before. And very often, they can be helpful. Other issues have to do with environmental factors. What can we control in an environment? Everything having to do with class size to can we provide alternative environment? And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we move on in a few minutes. And partner behavior. We have to consider the fact that sometimes our behavior can be the trigger or at least a contributing cause to problematic behavior. Examples of that might be is if we talk too quickly, if we use a punitive tone to a student who's hypersensitive to being judged or a student with low self-esteem who feels I screw up all the time, I get it wrong all the time, and in many cases, that may be conveyed inadvertently by school staff, by parents, by other people in a child's life. So an emotional regulation perspective from educational programming point of view is that we must view problem behavior as the outcome of a dysregulated emotional state. In other words, the child is not able to stay well regulated, and it is really their dysregulated emotional state that we're seeing. It isn't the child intentionally engaging in behavior. Now, I know some of you out there are saying, well, I do know some students who intentionally engage in problematic behavior. And I often ask, well, what are you describing? Give me an example. And they might say, oh, 
when a, a student says some curse words out loud and then looks at me and smiles, or a student who refuses to do some work, but he doesn't look overwhelmed or challenged or upset, and then he watches how I respond when he says to me, I'm not going to do this. Well, there's a simple phrase that you're all familiar with. It's called testing limits. And many of you know that testing limits is a part of child development, and we have to understand that in those situations, we have to make expectations clear, but make sure we have the appropriate supports in place for students. So when we see problematic behavior that doesn't appear to come out of a mild to extreme dysregulated emotional state where the child looks well-regulated emotionally, looks like they're observing, taking everything in, in those cases, we might be see test testing limits. We need to focus on enhancing a child's ability to regulate their own arousal. So in just a few moments, we'll talk about self-regulation and some strategies to support that. But we also must prioritize emotional well-being in general, which we define as a student being available for learning and engaging socially. So when we are all well-regulated emotionally, we are most available for learning and engaging. And this is one difference between an emotional regulation perspective and, for example, a behavior intervention plan perspective. Many of you know that we are legislated to legally write behavior intervention plans for students where the team has decided there's a significant pattern of problem behavior. An emotional regulation perspective does not start at the identification of problematic behavior. It really sees the need to have the right supports in place throughout the whole school day and ideally in the home environment as well. And we believe that's the deepest level of preventative approaches, that when we are doing things to keep kids well-regulated emotionally. And I see good teachers doing this all the time. They may not use these terms, but for example, they do fun activities throughout the day in the classroom. They don't require that for their children in their class, they see this for long periods of time. That is part of an emotion regulation plan if you will, that if a child experiences positive emotion, has a chance to get up and move around, maybe can be taught at, during some activities, seated on a rug and seated in their seats at other activities. I've seen teachers put on music throughout the day where the kids get up and get their yayas out dance, which helps them get their energy out and supports positive emotion, which makes them more available for learning right afterwards. So let's talk more specifically about what we hope children can learn. Self-regulation, a notion that many of you are familiar with, which really comes from the occupational therapy and the infancy literature, that is emotional regulation that is achieved independently without the support of others. We all self-regulate constantly. We all sometimes engage in activities such as pacing, such as rocking, such as putting on calming music. Um, after a very, very busy day going home and just staring at a wall for a few moments, that is self-regulatory behavior. We also create environments that help us regulate. Mutual regulation is emotional regulation that occurs in the context of supportive social interaction with others. So when a teacher helps a child to understand what the requirements are, maybe takes a child for a walk, or maybe a teacher's aide, a paraprofessional takes a child for a walk at school, that might be an example of um, mutual regulation. Ideally, we want students to be able to ask for support, to ask for a break, to ask for help, so that they can seek out support from others to help them regulate. That's the highest level of mutual regulation, when a student can perceive that they're be becoming anxious or becoming overwhelmed, and they just can't focus. Again, think about that. We do that all the time. At social events we don't want to be at, I always like to say, you know, that sometimes we'll see a friend at a social event if we're feeling anxious because we know so few people there. And then we go over to the friend and say, oh, take a walk with me, or why don't you talk with me? So many examples that we can give because we all engage in self and mutual regulation every day throughout our lives. In some cases, one way to help students is to reduce the amount of stimulation, is to talk less. So a very famous quote from the Dalai Lama is, remember that silence is sometimes the best answer. I too often see very well-intentioned professionals, teachers, and parents, when a child is upset, talking too much and talking too quickly. And it's kind of like putting the proverbial gas 
on the fire, and the child gets more dysregulated, more anxious under those instances. A woman named Roz Blackburn, who is a woman with autism from England, who I've gotten to know very well over the last few years. I've hosted her, invited her over to the United States, and I've had the great privilege of presenting workshops with her. The advice she gives to people, because she does become anxious and actually has panic attacks in her life, it's quite rare now, but she tells people that if you see me getting anxious, support me in silence, support me with your presence. Do not talk a lot at me, do not put your hands all over me, because that will make me more anxious and more emotionally dysregulated. So sometimes we do things with all good intentions that actually end up putting more gasoline on the fire, and we have to be very aware of our own behavior. Another point that we have to be very aware of, especially in school settings, but this pertains to other settings in life, is the notion of emotional memory. And that is the affective component of memory. So often we think about memory as what do we remember factually, but emotional memory is kind of, well, what's the emotional tag that we put on going to the movies, a particular movie, maybe visiting relatives, going into the school environment. So emotional memory has to do with feelings experienced and associated with a person, which can be joyful feelings or stressful feelings, a place. So a place may, in our minds, be safe or threatening, an activity or experience, which may be fun, interesting, challenging, or boring. And we really need to understand that emotional memory plays a great role in emotional regulation. So, for example, if we say to a child in a classroom, well, it's time to go to gym, and the child starts screaming, no gym, no gym, that child probably had some very stressful negative experiences previously going into the gym. Even in learning academics, some students will respond very negatively to particular kinds of academics that they know is very difficult for them. Some students with motor planning issues may respond very negatively to activities that involve fine motor skills and motor planning, such as writing, such as penmanship. So we have to understand that when kids refuse, especially when they're not already in the activity, that may be an issue of negative emotional memory. And the place we don't want to get to in a school context is a term that you're all familiar with, and it, it is school refusal, where when the school bus pulls up in the morning, the child starts screaming, refuses to come out of his bedroom, or maybe runs down the street. And when I've been involved in consulting on school refusal issues, very often we have to start at the place of creating positive emotional memories for a child in school. We want our students to love school, to want to go to school, to look forward to school. And as a matter of fact, from a parental perspective, in my consulting and when I meet with parents and the school team, I just love it and the team loves it when a parent says, well, we know something is going right because my son or daughter is so excited to go to school. They just love it. They wake up in the morning and they look forward. They say, I'm going to have a good day today. Um, and that has everything to do with emotional memory of going to school and what happens in school. So self and mutual regulatory capacities allow a child to be organized and focused to problem solve, to communicate more effectively, maintain social engagement both, both with peers and with adults, and to be most available for learning. Supporting emotional regulation, as we've said, is also about our behavior. So once again, at the risk of being redundant, we need to really make sure that we are modeling behavior for students that keeps them well-regulated emotionally and desirable behavior that we want them to emulate and we want them to learn. An emotional regulation approach for problem behavior has as its overarching goal supporting emotional well-being to maximize availability for learning and engaging in all activities. And here are some universal rules to support emotional regulation and to prevent problem behavior. First of all, having developmentally appropriate expectations. Too often I see, again, sometimes with good intentions, students being exposed to academics that are well beyond their capacity, or even exposed to activities, for example, that require motor skills well beyond their capacity. Or maybe expecting a student to be seated in a class for 40 minutes when they're really capable due to their arousal issues and due to their impulsive issues, they're only able to stay seated for 25 or 30 minutes when we need to begin to build in breaks at those times. 
Rod Blackburn, who I spoke about just a minute ago, said to me once, you know, Barry, if you want to help every person with autism on this earth tomorrow, here's what you could do. Slow down the pace of life by 50%. Too often, there's too much stimulation. We speak too quickly. We transition too quickly. And of course, transitions are a major at-risk time for problem behaviors for so many students. And if we try at least, even if we can't do it throughout the day, to provide those circumstances of reduced stimulation, slowing down input, simplifying the environment, it often has a very beneficial effect. We want to use appropriate interpersonal and learning supports. So as an example of a learning support, using organizational supports, um, such things as morning routine checklists, these can be made at home where a child understands through visual means what are the steps. I could check off the steps when I'm done with each step. We often recommend these routine checklists, organizational supports for students because one of the greatest triggers for emotional dysregulation is uncertainty, not knowing what's happening next, and not knowing how to organize all of the steps to get to an endpoint which is referred by some as executive function abilities, knowing how to not only follow but formulate the steps to reach an end goal and to be able to keep away from what's distracting as we're focused on reaching that end goal. We want to prioritize social communication skills. And even though I am a speech-language pathologist by training, it is not just the job of the speech and language pathologist. We need to have all team members on board in helping students, for example, being able to make choices, whether it's through oral language means, spoken language, whether it's through non-speech communication means, such as communication boards, speech generating devices with computerized speech output, being able to make choices, being able to refuse in socially acceptable ways, being able to say, no, I'd rather not do that now, or I pass this time, or I don't like that, or that makes me scared. Expressing emotions is huge in terms of preventing problem behavior. So these are some of the goals and objectives that we all need to focus on. And in an educational model that we've developed called the CERTS model for students with problems in social communication and emotional regulation, we put a great deal of emphasis on teaching emotion words and teaching language of social control so children can have, if you will, the ability to do that in ways that are socially acceptable rather than in socially challenging ways or even harmful ways. We want to build self-determination, helping students to make good choices, offering choices as much throughout the day. Sometimes it's not possible, but whenever it's possible. We could even begin to introduce that in academic activities. So if we're doing 20, 30 minutes of table work, and let's say we're working on reading and we're working on math, we can offer that as a choice to the student, what would you like to do first? We do know, um, there's a rich research base on this, that choice making improves social communication skills and prevents problematic behavior. We want to build executive function skills, as I just mentioned, helping students to plan and organize and make good choices in terms of self-regulation. A student knowing what they can do by themselves to regulate and sometimes requesting to do that. So I've consulted to classrooms where students, for example, who need breaks are able to go to the back of the classroom and do five to 10 minutes of an educational video every 30 to 45 minutes if it's too difficult for them to stay and stay focused on a teacher lecturing in the classroom. Um, I want to add to this and really emphasize the use of visual supports and multimodal teaching. So many of our students do not do well when there's too much of a focus on learning through oral language, being instructed, being lectured to and then utilize breaks systematically. And this could be done both in a preventative manner where the breaks are planned throughout the day, as well as a reactive manner. And what I'm referring to here is when we see a student becoming increasingly dysregulated, we can offer a break to that student. Breaks can be offered through visual supports in varying ways. So for example, a visual um, uh, choice board uh, for going into a flexible resource room. Um, a flexible resource room is a setting where a child might get extra social support, extra academic support, but we also use it for emotional regulatory support. 
And in fact, I just finished a two-part article on the use of a flexible resource room, and we will try to put up uh, a visual to let you know how you can get to some of these articles as free downloads on my website. Here's an example of a support in a classroom where a class actually developed this with their teacher. When I'm stressed, I can, for example, ask for a break, go for a walk. I could talk with somebody about that. Many different examples. I could have a snack. I could ask for help. And that would be self-regulatory, what a student can do by themselves. And for mutual regulation, these students came up with the following recommendations. When I'm stressed, you can help me by giving me space, reducing the, the noise level in the classroom, offering me some choices, taking a walk with me, talking less, some of the things that we've discussed. So we know we all need emotional regulation plans. And very often in, when I do trainings and workshops, I ask participants to take a few moments to write out their own personal emotion regulation plans, which might include doing some exercise in the morning. It might include um, having a good cup of coffee, which helps me be more alert. And so, uh, me being a coffee drinker, let me say, it's probably not the healthiest way to be more alert, but it certainly is helpful. We all like to take our breaks. We all like to exercise, listen to good music. So what we're saying is we need to think the same way for our students. Can we develop an emotional regulation plan that would be helpful to them throughout the day? So our overall goal in summary is to move from behavior intervention plans to emotional regulation plans. And we need to do that by, first of all, understanding problematic behavior in the great majority of cases as a consequence of emotional dysregulation, um, helping students to build self-regulatory and mutual regulatory abilities as a part of this plan. We certainly have to understand developmental variables, meaning that are we engaging a student in activities that have developmentally appropriate expectations. And by the way, this can go both ways. If we do activities that are much too simple for a child, boredom can result in problematic behavior. But more typically, if we're developmentally way above a student's level of understanding, whether it be in academics, whether it be in language processing, then that puts the child um, or the student at risk for problematic behavior. We have to implement a range of supports for emotional regulation including um, interpersonal supports, and that is the way we behave, as well as learning supports, such as schedules, um, such as visual supports. And of course, if we are being family-centered in our work, we need to make all efforts to engage the parents or family members in supporting emotional regulation in a way that's collaborative and certainly not judgmental of the family. So it's my hope that this discussion gives you a little bit of a different perspective and maybe even some specific strategies that you could implement in supporting students in your schools. Thank you.